In a bid to make the very best creative education available to all, the award-winning School of Communication Arts have launched a huge sale across their best-selling courses for agency creatives to fuel diversity in the industry. 20% of sales will go to Brixton Finishing School, and all further profits will feed into SCA's scholarship programme for 2023. The courses on offer cover everything from creative techniques and frameworks to brief writing and leadership training. Perfect for interns, junior teams, midweight creatives, and those in leadership roles who want to upskill and enhance their careers. Head to scacreativetraining.com to see the courses for sale from only £150 per person. Learn with SCA and change some lives along the way. I can't get no call to action. I can't get no call to action, but I try. Hello and welcome to Call to Action, the go-to podcast for anyone trying to make sense of the world of marketing, business and beyond. In an industry that is a minefield of utter bollocks, we aim to capture our heroes and allies from the front line to have a chinwag with. It's like Pokemon Go, with the single but vital exception that it's not a short-term bandwagon of shite. It's brought to you by Gasp, and I'm Giles Edwards. Today, I've caught Matt Watkinson again. Three years and almost 100 episodes ago, we masqueraded as a waiter with dreams of Hollywood to snare one of Reading's finest exports, where he was and remains in LA. An internationally renowned author, speaker to a whole host of brands, and consultant on all things CX product and business, Matt's latest tome, Mastering Uncertainty, explores and advises how to turn this inherent source of anxiety into an advantage. Rory Sutherland says that management consultants will hate it while secretly agreeing with it. With perhaps a nod back to his relentless nature that came up in our previous episode, Matt says, the good news is I've taken the stairs so you can take the elevator. To those who haven't fled the UK, elevator means lift. Welcome back to the show, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> the introductions are always so good. I've forgotten about that whole bandwagon of shite thing. Oh. It's so flawed given Pokemon Go's success, but it's become a distinctive asset of sorts. So. <laughs> I do miss the sense of humour. I really do, being over here in... <laughs> In LA, it's not quite the same as being back home in in Reading. Right then, Matt, we've got our seven quick fire questions. So, on that note, Reading or Slough? Oh, Reading. Good man. Host or guest? Host. (laughs) Honda or Ducati? Honda. Okay, on a similar line, make or restore? Oh, it's a fine line (laughs) between the two. When you get into it, I'm going to go with restore. It's marginally less stressful. (laughs) Okay, talent or luck? Mm. Mm. Both. Maybe luck Luck has the edge, maybe. Uh, Timor, uh, favourite word time, bamboozle or gallimorphy? Oh, gallimorphy. That's an amazing word. (laughs) We, uh, we uh, on episode six of Call to Action, Vicky Ross and I concluded bamboozle was the finest word around, so expect to hear from her. And finally, quite ridiculously, Caroline Quentin or Carolyn Barkley? Oh, Carolyn Barkley, for sure. Hi, Carolyn. <laughs> Wicked. Nice one, Matt. Well, good to have you on the show again. We, uh, we typically kick things off by asking about the route that our guests have taken in their career but for the sake of time we'll encourage anyone who wants to hear about your quite unique early career path in as much as you didn't have really you've never actually really been employed in in the traditional sense perhaps to listen to your first episode which is episode 
36, which we'll link to in these show notes. Uh, so for this episode, let's get stuck straight into your latest book, Mastering Uncertainty. And in the book's intro, you mentioned you had no intention of writing another book. So what changed? Oh, well, a few things changed. First, um, I, well, this was at the earliest uh, stages of COVID and I was kind of largely housebound and I thought if there was ever a time to to write something this seems like a pretty fertile void (laughs) like we're not going anywhere we're not doing anything so the the timing in, in that regard was opportune but it was more that what I was learning from Chaba who was first of all a close friend then a kind of mentor and 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 then you know we started looking at, at things that we could kind of do together i just thought i'm i'm a guy who has already written two business business books right i'm sitting on the visiting faculty of one of london's top business schools i have read 500 plus books related to my field whether it's psychology strategy design you know whatever it is How do I not know this shit? (laughs) Having put the energy and effort into into learning that I had systematically over the last 15 years, I wasn't aware of of these vital concepts or there was this gaping hole in my worldview, then almost certainly the vast majority of people would would find themselves in, in the same boat. And, you know, the concepts just seemed too valuable uh, not 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 to share. So, you know, Chabra and I were kind of a, a brilliant team on this book because he's, you know, a, a very successful investor and entrepreneur, and I can type. <laughs> That's exactly the team that you're looking for, someone who's a, who's a, who's a genius and someone who can write. So Chabra is not keen on writing at all. So it was it was kind of played to both of our, our strengths, really, as a project. Yeah, sure. I liked, I liked you labelling COVID a, a fertile void. Was there anything about the uncertainty during COVID that might have even kind of subconsciously nudged the topic of uncertainty? Or am I trying to force a link there? The, the, well, the interesting thing is that when you have events like COVID or when you have that chemical warehouse exploding in Beirut or the collapse of SVB or a big earthquake or or whatever it is, these kind of very salient events that appear to come out of nowhere and plunge us into chaos and telegraph this message very clearly that the world is unpredictable and uncertain. We tend to start saying, wow, things have never been so uncertain. But the reality is that unpredictable and unanticipated events are happening every single day. Not all of them are are large. Not all of them affect everybody in the way that something like COVID has. But they're all happening all the time every day. It's just that our brains are, are working overtime to try and screen that out. Um, because we cognitively feel very uncomfortable with it and and the other thing about that is you know there's there's a wonderful quote in in the book from a writer gk chesterton who who makes the point that the the world is is just kind of just reasonable enough that makes us think that it's logical and predictable but it's but that's a a trap you know if if life was completely random as I, as I say in the book, we, we'd never feel comfortable leaving the house and we wouldn't feel comfortable staying in it either. So there are, there are of course, some th- facts of, of, of life that do seem to be relatively uh, consistent and reliable and robust. The sun's going to come up in the morning, hopefully. You know, but, but from a business perspective, there's not really any value in knowing those things that are utterly reliable and consistent because everybody knows them. Right. So, you know, really the source of all opportunity in business is this un- uncertainty and unpredictability and that the future isn't written and that that gives us the opportunity to be the ones who write it. There's a couple of parallels there that I 
I forget precisely the the context of the conversation or when I heard this uh, exactly, but there was also given that the, you know the human brain craves patterns, I suppose, if not certainty. I heard someone say that there's nothing about the behavior of water as you gradually heat it that suggests that it will turn into a gas when it reaches 100 degrees Celsius. And I've always loved that, that that idea that that there's, there's this kind of obsession of craving certainty and trying to predict the future. But actually, that just one fairly silly example, perhaps, does also say so much. Yeah, I mean, one of the mental models that uh, is is or, or one of the sorry the the examples that's in the book that is is a very very powerful analogy is the idea of building a pile of rice one grain at a time. So eventually you're going to get to a pile that's pretty big and pretty steep, and then you're going to add one grain and it's going to cause an avalanche. Like the sides are going to are going to slip, and that makes sense to everybody. But the thing about that is that you can't tell which grain is going to cause the avalanche. And there's nothing special about the grain that does. And you can't tell how big the avalanche is going to be at any given moment in time because you don't know which of the grains in the pile are on the verge of toppling, right? And so if you were to visualize growing that rice pile as a graph, it would go up, but there would be these jagged kind of collapses in in the graph and it would go up and down and some would be big and some would be small and and you wouldn't know and you can't predict it. Now, it turns out that that pattern of unpredictable collapses of varying size is is almost ubiquitous. It's in the size of forest fires, it's in the size of earthquakes, it's in movie ticket sales, it's in the size of wars, it's in the size of economic collapses. Like this this particular pattern is is prevalent everywhere as a kind of feature of dynamic systems. And it means that often life-changing events have very trivial beginnings. It's like one grain and and off we off we go. I mean, it's we're going back a while now, but if you think about the Arab Spring, you know, a, a police officer slapped a fruit seller somewhere in Tunisia, and a few months later, all of these governments and regimes had been had been toppled. I mean, you just couldn't have the latent conditions were kind of there, but you can't predict when it's going to happen. And and I think if people look at their personal lives and you look at what turned out to be a life-changing event, it didn't arrive with heralds blowing trumpets and enormous fanfare. It tends to have a very trivial beginning. Like maybe you just met somebody randomly on the train or you sat down next to somebody on your first day at school or, you, you know, whatever it might be. So, yeah, there's a lot going on in the world that is inherently unpredictable. And it's just that our brains through the kind of hindsight bias or through the illusion of control or through post-rationalization or whatever, find ways to try and kind of screen it out. And isn't uncertainty, obviously uncertainty manifests itself in our lives, both from a personal and professional perspective. But do people understand with their professional hat on do people understand certainty to just be a negative thing that should be avoided at all costs or do you think that we do we are trained in a way to see the opportunity there well that that's a really good question Giles I think I think we've got a culture in business where we are desperate to try and banish uncertainty we're trying to expunge it and we're trying to eliminate it, which is why there is so much emphasis put on upfront planning and strategy and analysis and data gathering. And why, you know, if you look at what gets packaged and sold by management consultancies and academics, the underlying promise of the majority of that is less uncertainty, isn't it, really? And I I think we've been conditioned to think of uncertainty in business as being bad and as something that, you know, when people start talking about uncertainty in the environment, that's kind of the same thing as I'm saying, we're stressed out and we don't know what to do and we're worried. 
you know, and when people start feeling like they're very confident and certain about things, they tend to feel feel very very happy. Like what what is really being sold to people is is certainty, and it's because certainty gives a feeling of control, and control is ultimately ultimately what we want. But you make very very different decisions, or you approach your decision making rather in a very very different way if you are accepting or indeed embracing uncertainty versus denying it or constantly trying to expunge it. And it affects you very differently commercially and it affects you very differently psychologically, which was the, the you know, really why I wanted to write this book because I realized that our relationship with uncertainty prob- uh, has a profound implications for just about every aspect of our life from how we cope with setbacks and and failure, how we frame that and internalize that through to how we go about launching new products or services, how we go about growing our company, or really how we go about fulfilling our potential in in any aspect of life and and even how we think about managing managing relationships and setting goals. Now, all of this stuff, if you stop and think about it, is colored by your relationship with uncertainty, which makes it a major, major force multiplier that can affect your success and well-being for the better or the worse, depending on what your relationship with uncertainty actually is. Yeah, there's kind of a conflict there in some some ways in terms of how you might adopt that. And if I just if I just think about me in my position running an independent marketing firm, I understand that a lot of what we recommend and advise to clients is it's never based on certainty. And I have a massive issue with people who try and trade certainty in this industry, because actually the, the, what it really is, is a way of minimizing risk or, or, or the opposite of maximizing your chances to succeed. Not that the two can, can exist independently of of each other, but then at the same time, uncertainty is probably the only constant in in whatever recommendation you're, you're, you're making. So it's not so much of trying to change the conversation that certain uncertainty is a positive thing but equally it is as you allude to in the book it is really a, a matter of mindset and 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 you talk about confronting uncertainty so how do you how do you keep uncertainty as a, as a topic that is front and center whilst also enabling people to walk into a uncertain future well the thing is that i'm i'm actually not sure this is an interesting, interesting point. I'm not sure uncertainty as a topic is front and center. And I think that's part of the problem. I mean, I, I, if you look at an MBA curriculum, for example, or, or just an undergraduate business school curriculum, how much is taught about the uncertain nature of business? Like how, how much is taught about the, the fact that because the vast majority of what goes on in the world is out of our control and because those things can change unpredictably, we're dealing with an inherently uncertain environment, inherently uncertain. And so our approaches to decision-making have to be probabilistic because we don't really know if something is going to work until we've tried it. That mentality and ethos and that insight and understanding is not well, that is is not embraced by the mainstream of management at, at all from what I can tell. The only people who really get that are entrepreneurs and investors and, and people who run their own business. But even some people who run their own business, if they've been formally educated in this way, they're kind of at war with this uncertainty. They're like, why isn't my strategy working? I just need more data. I just need more insight. I need more data. I need more analysis and I need more strategy. I need more, 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 more. Because when you think about it, and and, and I think this is a fundamental point, if, if your mindset is one of denying or constantly trying to minimize uncertainty, right? Or, or if you even believe that it's possible to make successful decisions by eliminating the element of chance, right? You invest heavily in strategy and planning and analysis and data gathering. And if it doesn't work, 
in that mindset, who's at fault? It's you. It's an indictment of your capabilities and competence and strategy. And it's you who wasn't clever enough. It's you who wasn't smart enough. And that problem is amplified by the hindsight bias where after events have unfolded, it all becomes extremely obvious where we went wrong. So you beat yourself up a lot and you struggle a lot and you waste inordinate amounts of time trying to get to certainty before you act. If, by contrast, your mindset is, well, there's a lot of uncertainty in the environment and the only way to know is to try. And if we try and we don't succeed, we'll learn something and then we'll try again. And this is all a numbers game and it's probabilistic. And there there are things that we can do to, you know, be smart and eliminate knowable risks and everything, but we can't really know. Then if it doesn't work out, it's not that you're a bozo or, or a clown or, or an idiot. It's that you're accepting there were things that were unknowable and those those events affected our outcome. And now we're going to adapt the plan and we're going to keep going. And you're going to beat yourself up a lot less and you're going to be far more open. You're going to be far more curious and you're going to be far more willing to learn. Like in my life as as a consultant in the last 15 years, I think I've only seen two organizations or two projects where people fundamentally changed the plan in response to events unfolding. The rest of the time, they're just like, we started the project, so we're finishing it. We've made the plan, so we're going through with it. You know, because of this wrong-headed underlying belief about uncertainty and and putting so much faith in upfront strategy and analysis and realizing that if the plan wasn't working, they had internalized that as an indictment of their ability or, or, or judgment rather than a fundamental factor of dealing with being in an uncertain world. The other, the other element there that you, you open part three of your book on mindset on is a, a quote from Rafa Nadal referencing his own, I suppose, talent or at least success. And he says, I don't think there's any secret other than hard work, dedication and talent quickly followed quite rightly by you as uh, uh, to say, but what of luck? And I know we've had, it'd be wrong of me to talk about luck without nodding um, to Andy Nairn, who we had on the show recently to talk about his book, Go Luck Yourself. But it's, and it's funny, and in our conversation, we kind of concluded, or at least Andy offered that luck is seen almost as a dirty word to acknowledge it. But, but you make very similar points about the role of luck. But what, what role does luck play in success, do you believe? And, and how does that link to uncertainty? Yeah, well, on the Rafa Nadal point, I mean, obviously he's a phenomenal athlete and I'm not in any way taking anything away from his insane work ethic and, and ability on the court. Far, far from it. But the, the, the fact of the matter is that he, his uncle just happened to be a professional tennis coach. He was born into a family of athletes and he had his talent nurtured by a professional from the age of three. So, you know, for, for all his incredible talent and ability and work ethic and everything, would he be Rafa Nadal today if it weren't for the extraordinary good fortune of having been in that situation where his uncle Tony happened to be an amazing tennis coach and spotted his talent when he was three? I think we can agree that the, the, the odds are much lower. So he had extremely good fortune as, as well. And if you look at anybody who is extremely successful, you will find that there will have been some element of chance in giving them, in, in, that eventually has led to, to the outcomes that they've, that they've got. And, and I, I myself, I mean, my first book, you know, my first book came about because I was, went to visit a friend of mine in, in Pangboard of all places. And his younger brother made me a cup of tea in the kitchen and I ended up chatting with him and saying that I was planning on writing a book. And he happened to be interning at one of London's top literary agents. And he said, if you've got a proposal, I'll put it on the boss's desk, which is like a one in kind of 10,000 chance or something that he'd actually read it. I didn't have a proposal, but I went home that evening and I 
churned away at my laptop for four days and I wrote the worst proposal you've ever read in your life. <laughs> but I got it done and I handed it in to him and he put it on the boss's desk and the boss read it and he said, well, called me in and he said, well, this is shit, which obviously it was. <laughs> but he said, there, there are some good ideas in here and here's how I'd rewrite it and keep in touch. And I rewrote the proposal, I got a deal, and then that agent represented the grid and mastering uncertainty and got me the world rights deals with Penguin. So like, we wouldn't be having this conversation now if I hadn't blurted out my ambition over a cup of tea in my mate's kitchen in Pangborn. I, I think it's just that there's this analogy in the book that's like, if you're riding a bicycle, you always feel the, the wind going against you, right? And if there's a very strong headwind, you feel it very, very strongly, right? But even if there's a tailwind pushing you along, you still feel that wind resistance against you. You still feel the wind on your face. And it's a bit like that with good luck and bad luck. We're very, very aware of our misfortune and the obstacles and challenges we've had to overcome. And we're typically very unaware of good fortune's propulsive force working in the background. Like I think about how hard it is to write all the time. I don't think about the fact that one in six people can't even read or write. Like that never even enters my mind that I was fortunate to be born into a family that valued education and uh, into a country where there were opportunities to, to learn to read and write. You know, we just don't really think about it. So the other, the other aspect of this is to, I, I'd prefer to move away from the word luck and move towards the the word serendipity, because I think, if you look at any major life event or anything that really set you up for success, maybe it's how your career got started, maybe it's how you met your partner or best friend or whatever, an extraordinary confluence of events must have come together to put you in that place at that time, right? It, it could never have probably have been planned. And then the opportunity manifested itself, right? Which is this, this serendipitous outcome, the upside of of randomness and, and, and chance, if you if you want to think about it. And we tend to denigrate serendipity as, oh, that was lucky, whilst we focus on strategizing and planning and everything as being the main event. But serendipity arguably is the main event because it has the biggest impact on the direction of our of our life. And that's something that you can proactively try to increase. You can increase the likelihood of serendipitous events by meeting more people, by communicating to a broader audience what it is that you do by doing more things for other people, by connecting more other people together, by trying more ideas, right? By just simply being open to the possibility that serendipitous events might be happening around you and just kind of tuning into them. Is that what you mean in the book when you talk about that surface area, luck surface area? Yeah, I mean, I I love this term. I didn't come up with it, uh, unfortunately. It comes up, it came up by a, a it was a software developer in Pasadena called Jason Roberts who coined the term. But he talks about luck surface area, and that's a concept that I really think is extremely valuable. Like you can increase your luck surface area by communicating what you're passionate about to to more people. I mean, this will make in in perfect sense to you Giles given the business that you're in if you're trying to sell a product or you're you're trying to market a product the more people who know about it and the more people associate it with a particular cash query entry point whatever the more likely they are to to buy it right so salience and, and relevance the same is true in, in, in like but you don't know who exactly is ready to buy at that particular juncture do you like they always say 95% of buyers aren't in the market for a product at any given time, right? Well, it's it, the, the same is true in your personal life and, and your career. You could expand your luck surface area in exactly the same way that marketers try and increase the likelihood of a, of a, of a purchase. Yeah, it's nice. I've never, I've never actually heard that, that, that term from, from Jason Roberts. No, it just really stood out to me. And it's a really nice way of thinking about it. But I think you're right. Your point about serendipity and should be the focus and their ways of maximizing your chances to, to achieve big effects through something that might fit under the, the term luck 
He was really, really smart. How about failure then and that fear of failure? Because when I started reading your book, I immediately and perhaps incorrectly kept thinking about that fear of failure, which I think can can really prevent and paralyze people into trying and, and, and succeeding in life. But I, sus- I suppose one feeds the other. It's the uncertainty which leads to the fear, which leads to that paralysis. But how, how much crossover is there between uncertainty and fear? Well, so fear of failure, I think, is, is, a, is a really important topic. And it's one that's very close to my, to, to my heart because this has been a major breakthrough for, for me. I've been paralyzed pretty much by fear of failure since, since childhood because of the environment domestically and academically that I that I grew up in where you know the kind of consensus was excellence in absolutely everything is expected of you and if you fall short there's going to be punishment or there's going to be shaming or any of those other kind of un- unpleasantries which later on in life manifested itself as a kind of pathological fear of failure which meant that, as I say in the book, I kind of limited my scope of activities to things that I felt I was very certain that I was going to succeed at, and then approached them with a kind of monomaniacal perfectionism that really is the hallmark of someone who's terrified rather than someone who's who's passionate and and excited and, and invigorated by the topic. So this is something that I feel very, very strongly uh, about as a topic. And I know having talked about it with a lot of people, it's something that a lot of people struggle with. And fear of failure is inherently connected to your relationship with uncertainty. The way that I was able to overcome this kind of debilitating problem was by changing my relationship with uncertainty and coming to several intellectual realizations that allowed me to kind of break this down. The first of them being that if most of what happens in the world is beyond my control, then my actions alone do not determine my outcomes because those factors beyond my control can have an influence, right? So, for example, if I apply for a job, I mean, I'm not going to do that because no one's going to employ me anyway. So there's not really uncertainty for me. Uh, There's absolute certainty that no one's going to employ me. (laughs) But if a person were to apply for a job, there are things in your control. You can try try and apply for jobs that are relevant for you. You can polish up your CV. You can maybe get some interview coaching. You can show up on time. You can look presentable. You can do your research. You can ask kind of vaguely intelligent questions, that kind of thing. What's not in your control is the other candidates, whether they think you're a good cultural fit or not, whether they think you're over or underqualified, whether they've already chosen somebody internally to take the role and it's just a kind of dog and pony show to tick the boxes for HR, what the political landscape is, what their exact kind of high hiring criteria are, right? So when you think about it objectively, you realize that the factors out of your control massively outweigh the ones that are in your control. So if you don't get the job, it's just that you didn't get the job. It's not an indictment of your value as a being. It's not an indictment of your competence or skill. But most people would naturally go through this process of of self-doubt, of hand-wringing, perhaps even self-flagellation, thinking, what's wrong with me, right? I've failed. But it's not so much that you've failed, it's just that this is a numbers game and you're, you're going to have to kiss some, some frogs to find the, the prince, and that's true of, of everything in life. So... You know, just accepting that events are beyond your control is one way to start developing a more healthy relationship with failure. Another way that you can start to develop a healthy relationship with failure is to realize that you can't succeed if you don't try. Now, a lot of people tell themselves, as long as I don't try, I can't fail. But that's not really true. In order to succeed, you have to try. And if you try, first of all, you might succeed straight away. Second of all, if you don't succeed, you will learn something valuable that will set you up for greater success later. And and if you don't try, you, A, you can't succeed, and B, you don't learn anything either. So C, you've kind of failed by, by default, right? So that's another kind of powerful intellectual r- realization. Another thing that you can, way that you can think about this is that 
the, the majority of adverse outcomes are actually learning events. They don't really do you that much harm. In fact, somebody said to me when I mentioned this that they think of fail as an acronym for first attempt in learning, right? Like, like I wrote in the book, I watched my son learning to walk and he'd like wobble around and fall on his ass or fall on his face or smack into something. I wasn't looking at him thinking, wow, look at my kid. He's failing to walk. What a dud. <laughs> no, I'm thinking here's somebody who's learning and learning anything involves trial and error. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. And if you think of yourself as somebody who is trying to learn and grow, then it's an inevitable part of learning and growth that you will make mistakes. Like there's no getting around that. Like nobody sits down to learn the piano and just plays Rachmaninoff's third piano concerto perfectly. It doesn't, it doesn't work like, like that. And then the, the last thing about this, just to really hammer the point home is that you can't achieve extraordinary results with ordinary ideas. Can you, right? That's just not possible. And if you're going to try something that is bold or is really innovative or pushes the boundaries or is an extraordinary ambition, by its very nature, you are going to face setbacks along the way. I mean, it would have been astonishing if SpaceX had been able to create one of those space rockets that fucking comes in and lands itself autonomously on a drone ship at sea without stuffing a few rockets and blowing them up. <laughs> I mean, it would have been astonishing. I don't think anyone would have expected that. But when it comes to us, we, some for some reason, expect that we're going to be able to, I don't know, write an 80,000-word book without an editor saying, this chapter's garbage, or learn to run an ultra marathon without pulling a muscle or have an idea for a, for a business and make it to a million dollars in revenue without realizing that our plan doesn't work, you know? So you have to recognize that there's a connection between extraordinary results and overcoming setbacks, which is why, you know, the success story of every entrepreneur really comes down to, keeping on going until they until they succeed right like imagine if jk rowling had just said oh fuck it after the 11th rejection of harry potter that would have worked out too well you know i mean dyson it took 1500 more than 1500 prototypes to get his vacuum cleaner to work the founders of sony it took them three years to come up with a product idea that actually worked they they thought about making a miniature golf course first and then miso soup and then they made a shitty rice cooker that exploded or didn't work or something and eventually they made a voltmeter that they sold that was funded by repairing radios right like it's a it's a tenacity thing because it's a numbers game thing and your number might not come up straight away so you know these things have really helped me to reframe failure as a learning opportunity and not as something that's desirable because obviously it's not desirable but as a necessary ingredient for success and i've heard a lot of people over the years you know oh we've got to fail fast all this kind of stuff that comes out of silicon valley and i'd kind of shrug and roll my eyes but i, I think it's because to, to my mind people haven't done a ex very good job of explaining the connection between failure and uncertainty and the inherently unpredictable nature of the environment that we're in. And I think a lot of those messages would make a lot more sense to people if they if they understood that context. Time, weather, and Always. We interrupt this podcast to announce that we will never interrupt this podcast with ads. Ads that awkwardly nudge you to contact the pod's host, Giles Edwards. Only last week, some pod listening companies did just that calling for guidance on proper marketing, but we're not asking you to do that. Nope. Anyway, back to the show. Case. No, I am your father. Yeah, I had Yoda pinned for Luke's father anyway. Hang on. Yeah, I oh, there we go. couldn't agree more. And I'm pleased you hammered that point home 
so well and it's it's something that comes up fairly regularly partly because i feel very strongly about it as as clearly you do too but also because it affects everybody really truly we've had everything from charlie russell i recall who i interviewed a similar sort of time to when we would first welcome you on the show and charlie is part of the goes wrong collective mischief mischief theater they are so she's effectively a, a, a stage, mostly stage-based stand-up comic. And she said, you you, you get that feeling of, of, of fear before every performance, but actually you, you don't ever overcome it truly. You just become more familiar with it. And actually that, which which could actually just be a byproduct of doing what you're doing and understanding that it's, it's that necessary ingredient. But I, I just don't think we spend enough time talking about it or proudly talking about it perhaps. Because again, we spoke. I spoke to Paulina Tenner and she used to host a physical event pre-pandemic called the Fuck Up Meetup, where people were only allowed to talk about their, you know, monstrous fuck ups and, and errors that they had had made. But in celebration for, again, that same same reason that it's a, a necessary ingredient. How does it manifest or how best can it manifest in businesses? Because a, a great point I took from your book, and, it, and it's perhaps true of yourself and Chaba, I hope I've said his name correctly, talking more about the concept of affordable loss rather than that horrible metric ROI, which can cause so many problems in our world. But the idea of affordable loss, to me, immediately suggests you're understanding there's going to be a uncertainty of sorts. Yeah, so, I mean, this is a total game changer. This is so funny because in Chaba's world, affordable loss is like the golden rule that everybody understands. And for everybody else, when you tell them this concept, they look at you like you've invented fire or something. The, the entrepreneur's modality is they don't give two figs about return on investment because they know it's made up and they know it's unpredictable. So they don't try to lock in an upside. They try to lock in a downside. So the concept of affordable loss is just to say, what's an, an amount that we feel comfortable spending on this idea to find out whether it works? Right? That's not going to affect us in any great way. Uh, it's not going to have any material impact on our business. It's just an amount that we feel comfortable spending to find out. Right, So hence the term affordable loss. And then you use that money to then run experiments, prototypes, do research, whatever it might be. So that's providing you with a financial guardrail because you're completely safe if you commit to that amount and you don't overspend it. Right. What we have found in trying to get our clients to use this instead of promising a return on investment is that, first of all, it completely changes the psychology of the team. Because if you've promised somebody, back to this point I was making earlier, if you've promised someone an ROI and you've written some fiction in Excel and you've done all your calculations, you know, first of all, if you don't meet that ROI, you have failed and that's on you, Right. If you go into it with affordable loss, you're going into it going, well, fuck knows whether this is going to work anyway, but we're just going to try it out. It creates a backdrop of curiosity, of willingness to learn. Uh, it creates a platform within which you can adapt and it makes it perfectly okay to say, this hasn't worked or we need to try something else or we've learned this versus this kind of ROI-based approach which says, well, we worked out all our sums and we did our calculations and we pontificated and PowerPointed and this is what we came up with and it hasn't worked, so that's on us. Which is where all this defensiveness and the suppressing of bad news and throwing good money after bad comes in. So ironically, working on the basis of affordable loss tends to create much less financial risk for organizations than inventing ROI calculations that they've you know, just fiddled around with until the numbers go from red to black anyway. The other aspect of this is that the more incremental an idea is, right, so the more it's just a tweak or a nudge to what you already do, the easier it is to try and anticipate what the outcome will be, right? So if we're going to increase conversion by 0.25% and it's going to cost us X to do it, then it becomes very easy to kind of have a, a roughly accurate forecast of what you think that payoff will be. So the other kind of latent consequence of thinking about or being driven by the desire for a knowable return on investment is that you limit your scope of innovation to 
not really innovation at all. It's just nips and tucks. So the desire for a forecastable return on investment and the desire to actually innovate are mutually exclusive from one another. And when I've presented this to people, they kind of go, oh yeah, never really thought about that. Like this affordable loss thing is a, is a game changer. Like people's eyes light up. But again, it's just it's just so fascinating that this is this is in, inherently obvious to very very successful entrepreneurs and investors, and seemingly totally unknown to to everybody else as a concept, including me. Which is you know why I ended up writing this book because I was like you know fuck people really need to know this if if we had applied this approach to projects for the last seventeen years. Like the outcomes, I I would like to think for, would, would be would be very very different and and much better, and there's a there's a broader element of this, Giles that I think is is probably, the single most important lesson in the book and probably, the most life changing realization of, um for me personally, and I hope that people will 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 kind of take this on board is that this applies in your personal life as well. So what we're encouraged to do is set like these SMART goals, if you're familiar with that acronym, where it's kind of achievable, it's measurable, all that kind of jazz. And in order to do that, we need to do we need to set something where we think it's pretty certain. And whenever we embark on a on a big goal, let's say it's like become a black belt in karate or I don't know, climb Everest on a pogo stick or whatever it might be, like our crazy idea is. We look at to, to the finish line of having achieved that outcome, which is the purpose of it, right? We want to get the goal or the outcome, cross the finish line. And we envisage all of the steps that we need to take to get there, all of the possible obstacles and challenges we might have to overcome. And we never get off the fucking start line because we're paralyzed by how hard this thing is 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 going to be. Right? And that is a major reason why a lot of people have bucket list ambitions or goals that they have never even contemplated trying to achieve. Well, a far, far better approach is, is, is first of all, to forget about your upside in a given situation and just say, what's my downside? What's my downside to going to this event? Well, I, I can't know that I'm going to meet somebody who's going to become a client and you know, become a billionaire from from their business. I can't know that. But I can know that if I don't go, then it's definitely not going to happen. What's my downside to going? I lose a couple of hours and it costs me 50 quid in drinks or, or, or whatever. If the downside is palatable to you in any situation and you're vaguely serious about it, you should just try. Like, what's my downside to asking somebody to meet for coffee or have an introductory Zoom call? Well, the worst thing that they can say is no. Well, boo fucking who? It doesn't matter. I've heard no a million times. And you know what? It's it's never physically harmed me hearing no. You know, like what's my downside is a far, far more powerful question to ask yourself in just about any situation, given our uncertainty, the uncertainty in the world, than what's my upside and how can I lock it in? But that's what most people are trying to do. So the most important question to ask yourself in pretty much any situation is what's my downside? And then the second thing is, what's the one next step I would need to take? Like just the one next step. And it's typically very, very easy. If you want to become a black belt in karate, the next step is probably Googling karate lessons. That's a pretty easy step. right? And then you, as uh, Chaba is very fond of saying, like this kind of cryptic Zen koan that he, he, he often comes out with, you build momentum by building momentum. Taking one step and then the next step and then the next step, the boulder starts to roll and then it's it's rolling faster and faster and then it's just going to bulldoze over those obstacles that, that that kind of come along. So it's really important to go from thinking, what's my upside and how can I guarantee it, which is going to limit your scope to the knowable, the easily achievable, to saying, what's my downside and massively expanding the scope of opportunity in your life, and then just taking the one next step that you need to to get started. And this has, you know, been transformative for me in, in a ton of different ways in, in life. 
you're right though I'm, i think i've just become that person that you refer to who just says wow i've never thought about it like that <laughs> but it's uh, really good it's really good matt i'm i think given the time i best move to our listener questions So asking the general public for their opinion, be it on Brexit or boat names, is notoriously fraught with danger. We've chosen two that came in for you, Matt. I'm going to start with Harry. Harry asks, this is a really good question. How can I better manage uncertainty and risk across a team? So I suppose in many ways, I I think a lot of what we've spoken about there, I can certainly see from my own kind of mindset perspective and how I might act but I, I I guess is it just simply a case of explaining that to an entire team so that they better understand the concept of affordable loss and manage that fear of failure better you got any tips there's a there's a chapter in the book on the implications for management and leadership that come about from changing your concept of uncertainty from something that's bad to something that's good um, and from something that's a, a, a fact of life rather than something that's ever going to go away. And the key themes are around, well, there are two. The first is to try and create what uh, Gerd Gigerenzer calls a positive error culture versus a negative error culture. Ray Dalio, I think, put it put it really nice in his book, Principles, where I'm paraphrasing, but he said something like, create an organization where it's perfectly fine to make mistakes and unacceptable not to learn from them. I think if you can try and create a team where you have this positive error culture where mistakes, for want of a better term, are acknowledged and widely shared and benefited from as learnings or lessons. I can't believe I said learnings. Ben is going to kill me for that. I <laughs> You really hate that word. You've got to say lessons. It's like <laughs> learnings. You've been in America too long. Lessons. <laughs> I thought elevator was bad. I, I have been in America too long because I bought my first gun. <laughs> have you? Oh. For, fortunately, Giles, it's a Theragun. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Do your worst. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's worked wonders for me. Uh, yeah, so error culture is, is huge. Like, are we celebrating, not necessarily celebrating, but are we acknowledging that mistakes happen because human error is is part of life and are we learning from those and the 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 second which you know is this huge topic that's exploding in popularity is this idea of psychological safety in terms of are we creating a team environment where people feel like they can share their ideas um without being ridiculed or or punished if they're if they don't work out are we creating an environment where people feel like they can contribute? Are we creating an environment where people can be kind of open and honest and and to an extent vulnerable in in sharing their their perspectives? And that this is a function of, you know, first of all, how much respect people have and, and how much permission people have. And increasing the two of those kind of increases the psychological safety of the of the team. I think fundamentally if more people acknowledged the amount of uncertainty in the environment, it would then allow them to create more psychologically safe environments for their teams to, to work in. But, um, you know, we're, we're probably away, away from that, but it's a, it's a noble ambition. So yeah, I go into this in, in much more detail in, in the book, obviously, but I hope that provides uh, some degree of value as an answer. Yeah, no, it really does. It really does. And, and Harry, you should, uh, you should buy the book. Yeah, Harry. What are you waiting for? It's available for pre-order, Harry. As as should Amy, uh, who's our, delivered our second listener question. And you may have already given the answer here earlier when you talked about your terrible, I think you may have said a stronger word, book proposal. Um, but Amy asked, what's the luckiest thing that's ever happened to you? Whew. I mean, the, the thing with the book was an amazing st- stroke of luck. But one of the, I guess, side effects of entirely reevaluating my life through the lens of uncertainty and chance events is that I've realized that so much of my so much of the good outcomes that I've had in life have been a function of relationships with people 
more than anything else. Like I, I would go, so, and in fact, I do say this in the book, like social capital is the precursor to financial capital. Like every opportunity in the in in life is born out of relationships with people. So, you know, actually focusing on building great relationships with people, being a host in life, not a guest, all of that stuff that's written about in the book is a huge is a hugely powerful way to increase that luck surface area and and have more op- more opportunity and and I, I do explain this story in in the book but like to to talk about it's not perhaps like the luckiest event but it certainly shows how trivial events can have massive outcomes and how you know this thing of you can't succeed if you don't try has has played out in my own life so when i was 18 I boarded a train at Talhurst Station, which I'm sure you're familiar with, Head, heading into Oxford to, to meet a friend for a drink. And I'd just finished school and I was looking for a job. And um, someone had left one of those free newspapers on the seat opposite me and I hadn't brought a book or my Walkman, I think it would have been at that time, maybe mini displayer. These were going back a while. Uh, or a book or anything. So I started leafing through it and I was looking for a job to earn some money. And I saw an advert for a sales job, a high paying sales job with no experience necessary. So I thought, well, let's fucking apply for that. That's got to be better than stacking shelves at Tesco's. So I did really for no apparent reason uh, apply for this job, which it turned out was in IT recruitment and there, which obviously I was completely ill suited to. And it was a complete disaster. And I think I was fired within three weeks, maybe two weeks, but this CV was kind of thrown on my desk for a guy who genuinely sounded like a really interesting person and absent anything else to do and having no clue what I was doing and having received no training. I called him up and said, do you want to get together? I'd like to learn more about you. And he took one look at me as this kind of 18 year old kid. And he was like, what are you doing? Go to university and, you know, just drop this whole thing. And that happened anyway, because I got fired, but I, I kept in touch with him His name was Hayden Sutherland. And when I got to university, I started teaching myself web design and he was involved in that kind of sphere, technology. And I'd kept in touch with him and he'd become a kind of mentor for me. So he put me in touch with another friend of his called Ed Texier, who'd left a big agency in London and had started up his own thing uh, out in the sticks. And he took me on as a kind of minion and taught me basically everything over a two-year period period that I worked for him. When I finished university, I got my first contracting role as a UX UI designer working for this guy, Hayden Sutherland, who I'd randomly met for a beer in Norberton uh, when I was 18 as a consequence of picking up this free newspaper on a train. Hayden kickstarted my career really as a as an independent contractor in UX UI. Fast forward uh, whatever, seven years, I ended up writing this book on customer experience principles based on my kind of success in that field. And the rest is is kind of history. So tracing it back, we wouldn't be having this conversation for sure. I wouldn't have written my first book, probably. I probably would never have gone into the field of of design or at least found success and traction in it if I hadn't met Hayden, who'd introduced me to to Tex, and none of that would have happened if I boarded a different train or even sat in a different seat or if that person hadn't left that newspaper there. I mean, it's extraordinary to to think about through that lens. And I'm not discounting the fact that obviously I had to pull my finger out and do some work at some point and that when these opportunities presented themselves, aside from the first job, which obviously I did completely fuck up. Like I did a pretty good job of these things. But it's extraordinary to think about the the sheer serendipity involved in all of those events coming coming together for me. And I think everybody's life story, broadly speaking, is probably like that, if they're to evaluate it in the cold light of day. And I actually find that really exciting because it means that every... Every moment really is pregnant with opportunity. Like, who knows? Somebody might hear this podcast and think, 
wow, that's really something that is really interesting with me and then uh, to me and they might get in touch with me and I might end up with a you know a new friend for life or a client or a colleague that I end up working with later who knows you know literally who who knows like every so I mean even appearing on podcasts and this kind of thing is expanding your serendipity field or, or luck surface area or whatever you want to think about but it's exciting to think about the fact that any trivial interaction we might have might be the genesis of some amazing opportunity down the line and that's why i've i've been at pains to try and point out to people that this uncertainty that we face isn't bad it's great if the world was predictable which we like to want it to be we ourselves would have to be predictable too Right? As soon as we had any free will, then that predictability would, would, would crumble. Right? As soon as we could decide to order a latte instead of a cappuccino, we'd be injecting uncertainty into the world. As soon as we had any desire to change our path in life or grow or develop or any of that kind of stuff, we'd be injecting uncertainty into the world. So... In order for us to want to have a predictable world, we would have to sacrifice our own free will, and I don't think anybody would want that. Right. So, so uncertainty is here to stay, but it's great because if the future is unwritten, it means that we get to be the ones that, that write it, and that's exciting, and that's where opportunity comes from. And so I think, you know, just recognizing that could really help people cultivate a better relationship with uncertainty in their life great answer matt the final part of our interview then is our four pertinent poses now you have asked these before but i i feel obliged to hurl them at you again matt so (laughs) number one what advice would you give to your younger self because that may well have changed i think the the advice that i would give to my younger self would would genuinely be the things that I've learned from writing this book. I mean, it's changed my life, my own outlook on life far more than than the other two did. The other two were just kind of putting capstones on on knowledge that I'd I'd kind of accrued through my working practice. But my relationship with with Chaba and what I learned from him fundamentally changed the way that I saw the world. So yeah, I would I would be telegraphing to my younger self about, you know, think about what's your downside and think about the fact that you can't succeed if you don't try and think about the fact that failing or adverse outcomes or unanticipated consequences are just a side effect of learning and growing. And in all seriousness, like, I'm not just advising my younger self about that I actually have a younger self who's my son and I'm and I'm really consciously trying to teach him those lessons even at his age now like we go out and play with his radio controlled car and if he crashes it he looks at me with this kind of slightly worried look on his face I say dude it's it's fine you're learning we're learning we're having fun it's fine like I'm I'm not I'm I'm very, very deliberate in the way that I try to teach him things as a consequence of trying to raise him as somebody who is comfortable with 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 these things as a as a better platform for development than, than the one that I think I had as a as a child. So yeah, I, I think about it a lot. Question two is if you could banish one thing from the industry, what would it be and why? Oh, uh the competition. Okay. They can go. That would make life a lot easier. Number three, last time you recommended thinking in systems, um, the nature of technology, financial intelligence and mastery. Is there anything you've read since, aside from Mastery and Uncertainty, which of course you've both read and crucially written? Um, are there any books you can recommend to our listeners? I really liked Accelerating Excellence by James King, who I've subsequently become friends with. I think that book solidified a, and distilled a lot of amazing concepts that I'd come across from other books about how you can, first of all, identify where your potential lies 
but second of all, achieve achieve your fullest potential. I really, I really loved that book. Another book that I've recommended a lot to people, and it's it's referenced and cited in Mastering Uncertainty because there's a whole chapter in there on selling, which bizarrely, again, talking about uncertainty, I didn't anticipate this, but it seems to be people's favorite chapter in the book. I think it's even Chabba's favorite chapter in the book. I drew heavily on a book called Gap Selling by a guy called Keenan, uh, which is a really valuable book for anybody. I mean, we all have to be in a sales role in life. So I think if more people read that book, that would be that would be really helpful. I've just been going through Rick Rubin's book. It's called The Creative Act. I think that's a, that's a lovely book for anybody who's creatively minded or at least wants to understand the th- the musings and processes of, of one of the most successful music producers of all time. We'll link to all three of those. Finally, we always dedicate every episode to someone and we bestow or hospital pass that honour depending on your view to our guest who has to give their reason why. Oh, uh, <clears throat> I think last time it was Ben, wasn't it? My business partner. The unsung hero of everything. <laughs> He's like a, it's like a prosthetic cardiovascular system, <laughs> that guy. And brain. It's like a prosthetic brain and cardiovascular system. I would say Chabba. Well, I, I owe Chabba a lot. He likes to keep a low profile, has no interest whatsoever really in being a public persona. But I consider myself extraordinarily lucky to have had the opportunity to learn from him. We're very, very, I think we share some fundamental core values. Otherwise, it would be very difficult for us to interact. But we are very, very different people. We come from very, very different backgrounds. We've had very, very different careers and and, and trajectories. I'm so fortunate to have had the opportunity to have learned from him and to capture a lot of his wisdom and, and ethos and outlook in this in this beautiful book. So again, you know, I just going back to some earlier themes, I met him at a party in Hollywood when I was drunk and I, I said he's Hungarian and I told him I can speak Hungarian and he said, can you? And I said the only thing I can say in Hungarian, which is an extremely rude kind of expletive sentence. And he laughed. And then we spent the evening kind of chatting. I said, let's get together for for coffee or something. And he kind of took me up on it. So again, like just being willing to go first and being willing to invest in relationships. Like if I hadn't done that, we wouldn't have ended up writing this book together five or six years later or whatever it is. But yeah, I, I'm I'm very grateful to him for what I've learned from him. And so, yeah, he would be a, a worthy recipient of my dedication. Perfect. Well, uh, quite rightly then, this episode is proudly dedicated to Chabba. Um, so as a final call to action, we have links to everything we've discussed in this episode, including, importantly, Mastering Uncertainty, which I would urge everyone to uh, to buy. Uh, how else can our listeners get more Matt Watkinson? Yeah, my social uh, media is restricted to LinkedIn. Uh, where I'm where I'm pretty active. So yeah, if people want to connect with me there or get in touch with me there, that'd be awesome. Um, yeah, and I have a website uh, where there's plenty of information there about books and other, uh, I think even our our previous interview is, is linked to on there as well. And all my idiotic side projects, building motorcycles and that kind of thing are on there as well. And that's Matt dash watkinson.com perfect well we've included links to both your linkedin profile and your website so matt thank you for for joining us again thank you for talking about serendipity so well uh giving us affordable loss the idea of luck surface area locking in a downside accelerating excellence gap selling the creative act and everything else it's been um it's been a pleasure and i look forward to seeing you in a few weeks thank you giles you're a scholar and a gentleman (laughs) <laughs> neither sadly but thank you uh, finally thank you to everyone listening if you've enjoyed this episode please do share and review the podcast keep your questions and guest requests coming in 
To get in touch, it's easy to find GASP online or you can email call to action at gasp.agency. Try and I try and I try and I try.